African Export-Import Bank, the trade finance bank for Africa. Welcome to this CNBC Africa Special Report. Today you join us from Lusaka, Zambia, one of Africa's 10 fastest growing economies and scene of the latest testimonies on the economic resurgence of the African continent. But the 22nd annual meetings of the African Export Import Bank will also be remembered for some very rigorous exchanges as well as honest introspection on some of the issues bedeviling growth on the African continent. Join me over the next half an hour as I explore these and other themes that were developed and discussed at the annual meetings. There is no beating about it. Foreign trade is at the heart of Africa's economic revival. Consider this. More than 80% of African exports are primary products. Gold, iron ore, platinum, cocoa beans, oil, diamonds, you name it. And in most countries, these account for more than two-thirds of all export earnings. But with the recent average economic growth of more than 5% threatened by a collapse in commodity prices, African thinkers, and indeed institutions, have been pushing the case for diversification of exports and value addition to the commodity exports to sustain growth. If we leave our economies with a structure where, for some countries, 70 to 90 percent of their export revenues are from unprocessed commodities, yeah. you won't get anywhere. That's true. So there is a need to today transform our commodities uh, and process them locally. And then those one billion Africans sure. are just waiting for one thing, is to consume their own products. That discussion on the first day of the meetings raised a heated debate about the deployment of Africa's estimated $500 billion in foreign exchange reserves, use of migrant remittances, and exploitation of other domestic resources. A crucial problem confronted by African countries' effort to mobilize resources to support industrialization is capital flight and other, other illicit financial flows. Over the past decades, we estimate that the continent lost over 1.3 trillion as of 2010 through capital flight, nearly the equivalent, the equivalent of the continent's total GDP, including accumulated interest uh, earnings on past capital flight. The stock of capital flight was 1.7 trillion by 2010. This figure exceeds the continent's uh, debt, ironically making Africa a net creditor to the rest of the world. The problem of capital flight presents a stunning paradox from the perspectives of both economic theory and common logic. How can a continent that is capital starved expend its resources to finance advanced economies? How can a continent that struggles to feed its own population continue to fuel the financial systems of safe havens and secrecy jurisdictions? And why does the continent expend so much of its time and human ingenuity to mobilize foreign capital, including debt, aid, and FDI, while its resources are leaking from its purse at an exponential pace? I submit that the continent has often spent too much time and resources chasing the wrong dollar. It is time that African countries design a strategy to not only mobilize resources, but keep their resources on shore. The annual meetings are an important opportunity for political leaders, economists, business people, and indeed academics to reflect on how to maintain the continent's development. Over the four days, seminars and panels covered everything from Africans investing in the continent to dealing with the ever-present conflict while playing to our strengths, heeding lessons from the past, and being better implementers. If this kind of foreign direct investment are used to facilitate the exploitation of your competitive advantages, for example, in natural resources, and Africa actually has two competitive advantages. One is natural resources. The other is large amount of underemployed young labor force. Those are the two competitive advantages of Africa. If Africa can you know, utilize those kind of competitive advantages, they can be competitive, and domestic capital mobilization will be at a high level. And under the kind of situation, you will also attract more foreign capital to come because they want to benefit from you know, the dynamic growth in Africa, just like in China. I think we are all now on the same wavelength, more or less, that the market economy 
uh, even the Chinese that talk of uh, market economy with Chinese uh, factor, they still talk of market economy. Um, I believe it may not be uh, the model of uh, development uh, as such, particularly now that the World Bank and the IMF are leaving us alone after they have messed up with structural adjustment and such things. <coughs> but I believe our problem is problem of policy and policy implementation. Do we have the right policy? And if we have the right policy, we implement the right policy so that we get the right benefit or the right uh, uh, outcome from our policy. There was also a time to ask age-old questions. Is it too late for Africa to be the world's light manufacturing industry hub? Listen to this case study from Professor Justin Lin, a former World Bank chief economist and vice chairman of the All China Federation of Commerce and Industries. When I was the chief economist of the World Bank, I did a very careful studies of the desert sectors in Ethiopia, compare that to China. Right. And I found that you know, the wage rate in Ethiopia is only about one tenth of the wage rate in China. Right. And a wage contributed to about 25% of the total cost. And, the and so it's a big, you know. And also you can consider a production model. You purchase all the raw material from China, ship them to Ethiopia, and produce in the Ethiopia, in Ethiopia and export to the global markets. Mm -hmm. So the raw material cost, parts and so on, will be the same as in China. And the difference will be the wage rate and the logistic cost. And the uh, logistic cost, because you need to ship everything from China to Ethiopia, should yeah. be increased a lot. Right. Yes, increased three times. Right. OK, but the logistic cost in China for the companies was only 2% of total cost. OK. And increased three times, that means now become 8% of the total cost. In Ethiopia. In Ethiopia. It has a 60, six percentage cost. Uh, uh, more of the cost. Right. But the wage rate was only one tenth of China. And uh, labor productivity in Ethiopia can be 70% of China. So if you move the firm from China to Ethiopia, you know, the wage part can reduce 22%. So you have six percentage point increase in logistic cost. Yes. But 22% reduction Advantage. in the wage cost. Yeah. The firm still have 16% earning margin. A margin by relocation. Sure. A strong theme here was also the rise in investment by Africans in Africa. Aligo Dangote's cement enterprise around Africa and MTN Group's presence in Africa are being replicated in retail, banking and other consumer-focused industries. But a lot of work remains. You know, the global financial architecture is structured in a manner that our economies cannot retain um, cannot retain, um, you know, you know, cannot retain the resources, and this, you know, it, it's structured in a way that all these research resources, at the end of the day, have to flow back to, um, you know, um, you know, back to the OECD <coughs> countries, and in, you know, like uh, my colleague Carlo was saying uh, in, during the question he was asking um, in, in the last session, he was asking, do you think the United States will allow you to have these measures and those measures? And the reality at the end of the day is that there has to be, um, in order to deal with this, there has to be um, you know, a structured strategic approach in terms of um, being able to free Africa and our resources um, you know, um, from the shackles of um, the, you know, what you might term globalization or the global financial structure. So in spite of these very real challenges, Africa is growing. We are the fastest growing region outside of India and still home to seven of the 10 fastest growing economies in the world. So across the 54 countries that make up the African continent, a quiet revolution is underway, if nascent. However, 
Sustaining and expanding the work of this across the African continent is a function of political leadership, the correct policies and execution. When we come back on the other side of the program, we're going to be examining some of history's most successful economies and how they were built. And we will also reflect on the work of the outgoing president of our Frexin Bank, Jean-Louis Ekra. Join me after the break. African Export Import Bank, the Trade Finance African Export Import Bank, the Trade Finance Bank for Africa. Welcome back. You're watching a special report on the proceedings at the 22nd annual meetings of the African Export Import Bank here in Lusaka, Zambia. It was a meeting at which we had a new president elected, and it was also a meeting at which there were some very interesting exchanges and lessons learned in terms of how to build successful African economies. Afrexin Bank, headquartered in Cairo, Egypt, was established in 1993 with a mandate to finance trade links between African countries. Of all the world's trading blocks, Africans trade the least amongst themselves. And the reason for that is simple. We consume what we don't produce and we produce what we don't consume. Think about it. Our cocoa and coffee beans leave our shores as primary products, land in Switzerland and Germany, and return ready to be consumed at several multiples of the original price. At African Bank, what are you doing about that? I was talking about cocoa just now. We have Africa Cocoa Initiative, which we have started. We have put together about $200 million already in companies in Ivory Coast, in Ghana and Nigeria, to process the cocoa inside the country so that you add that value. By adding that value, you have job creation, you have also more revenues which government can take taxes from. Yes. So we've started it. We've started helping companies in other sectors like cotton to process it. Mm -hmm. we, start, we help companies in the fertilizer sector here in Zambia okay. to increase the capacity so that they can send those fertilizer in the sub-region, right. which they are already doing. I recall in the mid-2000s reporting that intra-African trade was below double digits, versus 70% in Europe and more than 50% in Asia and the Americas. Jean-Louis Ekra told me that we are now approaching 14%. Clearly, there remains a lot to be done. But also clearly, the groundwork is already underway through institutions like a Frexin Bank. No. We are not moving fast enough, in my, my own view. I think we need to be a bit more aggressive about it. Uh, Africa is a continent with all the resources. You talk about human resources, our population is young. You talk about natural resources, it's well endowed. What are we waiting for? to use those resources in order to move our countries forward. It's the only continent that has 54 countries. So a obviously countries. it is. Obviously, for some countries, the future is under certain integration. Unless you integrate, unless they get into a wider space, they, there's no economies of scale. So uh, the tripartite is indeed uh, a movement in the very right direction, will it but make we a need difference? to move faster. It will certainly make what a difference. What difference will it make, do you think? A, a market of 600 million people is certainly a market where you can make more money, you can make more profit than a market of 5 million people. As simple as that. While we fix the structural and infrastructural issues in our economies, the politics, while improved, still requires attention. Former Nigerian President Olushagan Obasanjo, as usual, used his wit and edge to pass on some important lessons. If you are a good masquerade, masquerade and you are dancing, after you have danced for about an hour, all the ideas in your mind about dancing as a masquerade will have been explored <laughs> really after eight 
or 10 years, depending. What new thing do you want to show? Any country. But like all industrial revolutions, pain, frustrations and anger will be part of the process. So if Africa has to go forward ahead so that we also have something to do, we really have to embrace our own. Our own first. Let's see that my children are well fed before I look at a neighbor's child. Take the case of Belita Piri. Safely ensconced with her Dutch husband in the Netherlands, she heeded the call to come home and invest in Zambia. Some hard-earned 200,000 euros expended later, a tale shows the challenges of balancing FDI incentives against local participation. I've, I've, when, when my goods were, were taken, you know? These were pigs? No. Organized people, big people. Oh, this is like bags. Yes. Trying you know, to, to, to prevent competition. Exactly. Trying to prevent me from doing business. Oh. You, you get me, yes, eh? Yes. Trying to prevent me from doing business. They followed me in my small shop after they kicked me from their big shop. And then they made sure that you were not open. So they made sure that I don't exist. Even what I'm doing right now, I feel that my life is in danger. So, so, so you say effectively what you're saying is there's organized... Uh, yes, cartel. Cartel here. Yeah. And they go to extreme... Like yes, to, to, yes. To, to make sure that yes. there's no competition. Yes, there is no competition. They know what kind of garments I make. And uh, so she can't do it. You, you see, she's an African. She's, 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 yeah, she's Zambian, she's African, and she's a woman. So how can she come in and take up our market? Our market. Yeah. I lost my goods. A lot of money. It is a headache. The Zambia Development Agency is dealing with and there are no easy solutions. It hurts. It will be all right. Our mandate aims at promoting investments, attracting investments into Zambia yeah. from uh, foreign prospective investors. And also, I want to add Zambian investors, right. both Zambians here at home uh -huh. and Zambians who may be outside, uh, outside the country. Sure. So, Clearly, a delicate catwalk is required to bring the big bucks from abroad, while at the same time looking after Africa's millions of belitas. Let me share with you the vision of the new president of the African Export-Import Bank, Benedicto Rama, who believes it's not all gloom. There is a silent revolution going on. We are beginning to see uh, major companies around the world doing contract manufacturing in Africa, contract farming in Africa. They are able to do that because mm. they see cost advantages. Mm. So the goal for us, and we hope also the other develop, uh, multilateral development banks, uh, mm. like the African Development Bank, is to leverage on these opportunities and make sure that we accelerate okay. the industrialization. Absolutely. So as you do that, do you worry about uh, trying to spread this as far and wide as possible amongst the African countries, or do you only concentrate on those countries in which uh, the African Export-Import Bank uh, has shareholding? We will normally focus on where we have shareholding, right? Uh, because we have advantages. Uh, but the good thing is that uh, uh, the countries, we are 37 shareholder countries. Right. Uh, across all Africa. There are a few that are not yet there, but are joining. Um, the major ones uh, that are coming in. Uh, so uh, we uh, will cover most of the continent. But because we have certain policy privileges in the countries that are shareholders, yes. our focus will be uh, towards our shareholding countries. Absolutely, but it's important, isn't it, that you are all over the African continent. So, uh, in terms of those that still are not members of the Africa of, uh, of, of the bank, how far are you from uh, covering the whole continent? As I said, of the 54 countries, 37 are already members. Yes. Uh, there, are, there are three that we, we expect to join uh, before the end of the year. Mm. Uh, so, you're going to have about 40. Uh, there are still 14 that uh, we, we will not have, mm. uh, but uh, given the progress we've seen uh, and the benefits 
uh, I'm sure they know that the members are getting. Uh, I believe uh, that before long, we will have even more of the uh, of those countries that are not yet members. Yeah. Uh, we certainly hope that they will be coming. I promised that we needed to talk about the new free trade area that was created there in Cairo recently. What are your thoughts on it, and what difference do you see it making, especially in terms of your work as the financing, uh, as the Trade Financing Bank of Africa? It, it, uh, I was very happy that it happened, and I hope that the processes uh, to give it effect uh, get concluded within the time frame uh, the uh, the countries agreed. You see, when you create the kind of uh, tree, uh, free trade zone uh, that binds countries from Cape to Cairo, then you're getting closer to the continental free trade area that the AU uh, is working on. Uh, you have the ECOWAS that is, um, that is there and is operating reasonably well. We have the the the, the uh, union of the Central African countries that is also operating very well. Mm -hmm. So, with the success, the triple agreement we've seen, mm -hmm. then there will be the impetus to get others to join, so that we have the continental free trade area. If we have that, then the issue of the inter-African trade we are talking about will have a very very good platform uh, to evolve. Uh, don't forget that today Africa is still uh, the, the continent that trades the least amongst itself. True. Uh, which about 12% of, of its total trade is intra regional. Mm. Uh, but we are doing something about it, as I said. And with this, uh, we see greater progress. Mm. Mm. Uh, uh, what I didn't tell you earlier was uh, the work we are doing to use mobile techno uh, technology to facilitate intra-regional trade, right. to make sure that uh, cross-border payments are done effectively in support of trade, of the trade. And the overall goal is to make sure that the informal trade, which constitutes up to $60 billion as of today of the trade, wow. uh, comes on board. Uh, the reason we are not having that today is because yeah. the policy the governments are making to bring the informal sector into the formal sector yeah. uh, uh, does not take account of the characteristics of the participants. Absolutely. They are, they are atomistic. A trader from Zimbabwe goes to, uh, say, South Africa yeah. uh, with $1,000. So you need uh, an instrument like the mobile phone to make that person mm. to be integrated into the formal system. And we are, we are working on that project as we speak. Absolutely. Before I let you go, and we've run out of time, unfortunately, I need to talk to you about uh, one of the other initiatives that was spoken about at the annual meetings. This is the whole issue around harnessing Africa's resources for Africa's development. I mean, we talked earlier about the fact that you are raising capital and you are saying it's going very well. When you look around us, there's a lot of capital, pension funds around the African continent, sovereign wealth funds around the continent, our own foreign exchange reserves that we've spoken about that are staged abroad, a half a trillion dollars of them that are sunk into U.S. treasuries, German boons, and the, and the like. What are your views in terms of getting that money to work for the continent and enhancing uh, intra-African trade? I mentioned to you that we are pursuing what you call uh, a program of Africa direct investment. That's what we're calling it. Uh, the, the resources are huge in Africa. You, you got them. The pension funds, slightly under $400 billion, the reserves, about half a trillion uh, dollars. You have asset management companies. You have the sovereign wealth funds everywhere. Mm. Also, what we're doing is to target them, not only for us, for the equity we are raising, but also for uh, the companies we are supporting so that they, they look inwards rather than outwards mm. uh, for the kind of capital they need. I personally uh, have been around some of the countries. Yeah. I've spoken to some of the pension funds. And I know that many of them, uh, including the regulators, uh, are looking for them to diversify their investments away from their respective countries. And it is a responsibility and duty yes. to create the instruments that are safe uh, and effective 
for those uh, uh, pension funds and similar uh, entities to, uh, to invest, and we use it to pursue development. We also have what we call central bank deposit program, right. which are Could running be. as we speak, uh, which are using to mobilize uh, deposits from African central banks. So every little bit helps. So the next time you are passing through Ethiopia, buy some Ethiopian shoes. Or if you are passing through Kigali, Rwanda, some authentic Rwandan coffee, please. Or if your pockets are deep enough, some Tanzanites in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam, will make someone very happy indeed. It will all add up to the 14% intra-African trade. But surely, I forgot my Zambian beef. African Export-Import Bank, the trade finance bank for Africa.